Sorry, Toby. Um, thank you to one of the speakers. I feel I've got a really tough act to follow. Now we've been on that blood sugar roller coaster with the cookies. Um, I'm not going to get you doing any activity, um, but I do make a, a brief apology. I'm going to go through these slides quite quickly because I've got a lot to catch up or to go through in just over 10 minutes. Um, I would just start with the caveat, though, that I'm more than happy to chat to anybody, answer any emails, have any phone calls, meet on Teams. Or even if you want to come to Reading and visit the centre that I'm about to talk about, then you're more than welcome to, more than happy to show you around. So um, just have that one in mind. Um, so my name is Matt. I'm the Staff Health and Wellbeing Lead at the Royal Barks NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, we're an acute NHS trust based in Berkshire, and we've got around 6,500 staff. Um, I'm also going to take you on um, a little journey today. We're not going to go to Rome, um, but we are going to go on our journey of wellbeing provision for the trust. Um, in the three and a bit years since I've been in post. And um, most of you being wellbeing leads in the room, I'm sure that you can familiarize yourself with this journey. So we're going back to uh, pre-pandemic. Um, this is what our health and wellbeing provision looked like in our trust. So we had no dedicated staff health and wellbeing team. We had no dedicated psychological wellbeing support. We had, we still have, an aging hospital estate with a lack of rest areas and rest facilities. Probably the only good thing about COVID, at least one of the only good things about COVID, there was a lot more funding that came down by our NHS charities together and other such organisations that enabled us to improve that wellbeing offering. Um, and one of those things was for me, my post to be created. So I was the first full-time dedicated wellbeing person and I was appointed in November in 2020. And um, these were some of the things, and again, I'm gonna go through this bit quickly because I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. These are some of the things I did when I first came in post. It was looking at what are the needs of our staff. So before I came in post, we commissioned a psychological needs assessment, which was looking at um, the 10 most impacted areas of COVID. What were the needs of those staff in those areas and how could we make their well-being better and the services and the provision better for those staff? Um, also, we we're combating things like social distancing, meaning that the limited rest areas we had were very, very busy, and there were stories of some staff having lunch in their cars and things like that because there just literally wasn't anywhere for them to go. So then we launched a project, which is what we call the OASIS, so our Staff Health and Wellbeing Centre. And, and I appreciate that this is um, hopefully a very visionary thing to hear about, but the idea of this, of this is not for me to stand there and show off and say, oh, look how amazing we are, but it's just to plant that seed and saying, this is what's possible in some NHS organisations. Um, yes, the big caveat is funding, and I will talk about that, but even if it was something that could be done on a smaller scale, um, it is possible uh, to do this, and I'm going to talk a bit about the impact it has had. So we launched this project in 2021, and we were very fortunate to get a large public donation from a resident who lived in the area, um, and they gave us some money, and they said, this must be spent on staff health and well-being. Um, and it was incredible. It was like winning the lottery. When does that ever happen? So um, the thing we decided to do is to develop a wellbeing centre. We had short um, provisions of wellbeing. So, for example, our physiotherapy service that didn't function during COVID, we turned that into a temporary wellbeing hub. And that was really, really popular with staff. So when we had things like Domino's Pizza donating free pizza for staff, we distributed it out of that hub. So we knew there was a model there, and that's what staff were asking for. I've been asked to specifically talk about some of the challenges that we had to overcome. So the first one on there you won't be surprised to see is funding. And in particular, how can you prove return on investment for something? And how can you prove that you're not just creating a big white elephant that's going to be a drain for money? So I've got some statistics at the end I'll share with you. But also what I'll talk about at the very end is the legacy and the long term um, impact and ideas of things you can deliver from a wellbeing centre to keep the innovation high, to make sure the staff continue to come back. Um, and we have been really, really um, pleased with the impact it has had. The other thing was logistics and location. And I, I know some, some people in the room are community uh, trusts, so you may have multiple sites, which obviously this then becomes a lot harder. We have six sites. Our main site is in Reading, about 85, 90% of staff work at. So again, I appreciate it's probably easier for us having most, site, uh, most staff in one site. But the key thing is making sure that the building is situated or the area is situated in, in an accessible location for all. Staff engagement, keeping them involved in the whole process. So what we did is we renovated a, a grade two listed building that we already owned as a trust. We couldn't do anything fancy like knock down walls, but we did have the floor plans. We went to staff and said, right, we're building you a wellbeing centre. What do you want in there? We have some ideas. We think maybe you might want a gym. Um, we had some crazy things like an indoor heated swimming pool. Yeah, dream on. Um, but 
by and large, we were able to actually um, facilitate the things that staff wanted. So we're building what, you know, as, they, as the analogy says, build it and they will come. We created something we knew staff would want and would access. Um, and then the other big challenge was around managing those expectations and uh, estates and facilities contractors. Um, so a lot of this was done because of particularly with it being a great list of building with English heritage, lots of external companies to make sure compliance and all those legal legislation challenges that I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, specific learnings from the project. So if I could look back, if I was going back to 2021 and starting this project again, these were the key things that I would do differently. And I think this is a really, really useful thing. And if you take nothing else from the slide, this is, this is the kind of thing to think about. Is um, It starts from the top with effective project manage management. So the first project manager we had, communication wasn't very good. We did have bi-weekly um, groups, working groups scheduled to chat about the project. Um, there were many meetings went by where the project manager just didn't turn up. So we're left in the dark quite a lot. Looking back now, um, I, we would have been more proactive in holding that project manager accountable for those things. So that's definitely learning. Um, procurement. So I got given a building which was an empty shell, which was structurally sound, fantastic. We're opening in two months and, I, and I'd already contacted procurement and was assured that everything was in hand. I had a list of everything I wanted in the building, even simple things like signs on the doors, tables, chairs. Procurement turned around and said, yeah, we don't do that. You need to do that. So I had to become a procure procurement expert overnight. And I literally spent two months contacting suppliers, getting quotes, getting invoices, raising POs, all those kind of things. And um, at the expense of my day job. So yes, we now have a, a fantastic wellbeing center, but it was a lot of stress. <laughs> um, also, when we moved into the building, we found that we only had one phone line um, because nobody had told them that we wanted more than one phone line. Um, so very, very simple thing, but would be really specific around exactly what you want. Um, and then also finance would have been better to be looking at a long-term legacy Things like ongoing cleaning costs, uh, ongoing IT costs, things that often don't maybe don't think about that we're now finding, or oh, where which budget does that come out of, and we're having to do a lot of internal negotiation. Um, positives though, our board were really engaged, and our charity are really engaged as well. So it's really important to um, sort of uh, mention that in terms of the exec level support. Um, we then were able to open our centre in 2022. Um, these are a couple of pictures of the building and the garden. Um, and these are some of the things we have in there. We've got a free gym, we've got meeting rooms, um, we've got a large outdoor garden, a room where staff can go and watch TV, a kitchen where they can heat up their food, make free tea and coffee, um, and a lounge area where we've heard about the importance of connecting and being social and are able to come and, and have their breaks and that kind of thing in the building as well. And then I talked earlier around uh, innovation. So a couple of the things we've done to ensure the ongoing legacy of the project. We deliver staff health checks from the building. So we've seen um, just over 800 staff come for in the first 12 months for a health check. So that brings them through the door. And while they're there, we give them a tour of the building and show them the facilities. Um, and the, the key things around that, again, it's all about engagement. It is about ongoing funding. And then we've also launched a partnership with Citizens Advice. So we have a, a, a drop-in advisor come one day a week for any staff that want advice on housing benefits, landlords, that kind of thing. So um, here are some of the outcome data. Uh, so we've had, in the first year the doors open, we had 30,000 individual visits. So every time someone comes to the building, they have to swipe their staff ID card to get in. So we know exactly how many swipes have happened. And that was three, just over 3,000 staff. So roughly 40% of all of our staff came to the building at least once. And we're continually to drive that number up and up and up. Um, and we've had, um, as I mentioned, just over 800 health checks have been done. Um, and as a side note from that, 64% of those people, we have actually flagged them having a health issue that's needed medical intervention. So again, it's not just saying, oh, look how fancy we are, we've got a gym or we've got a meeting room. We're actually delivering wellbeing interventions that are making a difference to our staff. And when I talked earlier around return on investment, that's exactly the kind of thing that we can now um, showcase moving forward. Um, that's enough from me. Obviously, I'm going to stand here and say how amazing the project is. Um, I've got a two-minute video, which is some of our sort of frontline staff talking about the centre, and I'd really love for you to hear what they say. Well, I think I've learned during the course of my career that having a space where you can go to that's away from the office is so important for mental health and well-being. I've struggled with my well-being in the past and I've realised that you have to separate from the place that you work, even if it's just for like 10-15 minutes, 
just to get that reset and get back to being yourself. And then when you go back to your desk, you know, everything else kind of just seems much more simple, much easier. One part that I really love about the Oasis is the exercise space. Usually by the evening time, I'm too tired to be able to even think about going to the gym. So having it here on site, I'm a real morning person. So getting up early and getting in the gym before I start my day works brilliantly for me. And it just helps to start my day and keep me healthy. I have the chance to use a few meeting rooms here for training sessions, for training sessions. And one of the things I think has been really good about this space is that even though we're still on the trust site and trust property, it feels a little bit further away from the trust. So you can get people to open up a little bit, you can get people to feel a little bit more comfortable than they would otherwise. I love the weights room, as you can see, as this is a designated room that I'm in. Um, I find it very therapeutic and it helps me relieve stress after a long day at the work or whether I feel like coming into work with a lot of energy and I can to bring a good vibe when I get into work. I like coming here just to ease my tension, ease the muscles and get me relaxed before I get ready for a long day. So I think the Oasis is a really special place. Um, it provides a whole load of services, but one of the reasons that I use it in particular um, is for the quiet rooms. Um, and it's a place where you can come if you want to do um, some coaching or to have a private meeting with somebody. Uh, but most importantly, you can use it for the trim sessions, so traumatic incident management sessions where we have one-to-ones with people who have had a difficult time. So to be able to have this really special, very quiet place dedicated for these kind of sessions is so important. Lovely, and there's my contact details to say happy to um, chat to anyone outside of this as well. Thank you very much.